Well, Rania, we want to keep moving around the the continent here. I mean, I think it's important for people to be able to hear from the African continent, which is you know n- not really being talked about at all in the context of the of this broader conflict, but is obviously one of the continents most affected by the sort of subsidiary realities of the sanctions. So now we want to turn to Ghana, and we are very, very honored to be joined here by Kwesi Pratt Jr., who is the General Secretary of the Socialist Movement of Ghana. Mr. Pratt, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. Well, the pleasure is all ours. And, you know, I, we've been talking here about sort of the view from Africa on the crisis in Ukraine uh, and how, you know, there's a lot of voices we aren't hearing in the Western media. So I'm curious from your perspective, looking at this conflict, what is the, everything in the United States is blame Russia, blame Russia, hate Russia, hate Russia. And you're not allowed to say anything about NATO or about the West, but where are you putting more of the, I guess, blame, if you will, in this conflict and for, for why it it took place? Well, I think first of all, nobody can glorify war. War is a terrible thing. And if it is possible to avoid war, all of us should work to avoid war anywhere in the world. Terrible consequences, especially for the underprivileged all over the world. And and the avoidance of war is it's it's important. Having said that, however, I think that the efforts that are being made by NATO and especially by the United States of America, are not aimed at ending the war. They are not aimed at bringing relief to the people of Ukraine. They are just aimed on petrol, on on, on pouring petrol onto fire, on on instigating war, on, on, on leading the Ukrainians into believing that they are some kind of superheroes and so on, and they are dying. And, and nobody is coming to their aid. In fact, they cannot come to their aid. I think that this is this is this is really atrocious. This urging the Ukrainians on to do things that they cannot defend, to sacrifice their lives for absolutely nothing, you know, I, I, I think is, is most reprehensible. The other thing that I think is absolutely important is the general hypocrisy around the world. And there's so much about the sovereignty of Ukraine, the sovereignty of Ukraine, and the sovereignty of Ukraine. Who talks about the sovereignty of the Cuban people? Mm. The Cubans were sovereign. The Cuban state was a sovereign state. And yet, when the Cubans invited the Soviet Union to place missiles on, on, on the island, the U.S. protested vehemently. And the U.S. actually threatened to sink the island of Cuba. And so that matter was very quickly resolved as a result of the maturity of the Communist Party of Cuba and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. But who then spoke about sovereignty? Who then spoke about sovereignty when the United States was threatening to sink the island of Cuba? We are talking about uh, 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 the, the killing of civilians and so on. Compare what is happening to what happened in Iraq. The millions of Iraqis who lost their lives as a result of of the invasion of the United States of America on the basis of a false pretext. The U.S. and its allies claimed that they were invading Iraq because Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Up till today, nobody has found any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It was a lie, a lie told by the U.S. and its allies, and which has led to the slaughtering of more than a million Iraqis. The slaughtering of more than a million Iraqis. Who is talking about the sovereignty of the Iraqi people? Who is talking about the death of the Iraqi people at all? Are are, are Ukrainian lives more important than the lives of the Iraqi people? Look at the current situation in Palestine. Look at the current situation in Palestine. Look, look, look at the imprisonment of virtually everybody who lives in the Gaza Strip. They live in virtual prisons. You understand? Their lands are being confiscated on a daily basis. Young persons are being killed on a daily basis. Agricultural land is being destroyed on a daily basis. Hospitals are being attacked on a daily basis. Schools are being smashed to the ground on a daily basis. Who is protesting? 
about, about the apartheid regime, the, the Israeli apartheid regime, and the atrocities it is committing in Palestine with the help of NATO countries, with the help of the United States of America, with the help of the, or, 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 of the United Kingdom and so on. Who is complaining? After 20 years of war in Afghanistan, look at what the forces of imperialism have done to the people of Afghanistan. Who is complaining? Check the double standards and so on. And then we are told that this is all in defense of some democracy and freedom. My goodness, 2014, the Ukrainian authorities were banning political parties. They were closing down television and radio stations that they did not agree with. Is this the kind of freedom that we are defending? I just wonder. Now, in all of this, the real victims are the working people in the capitalist states. They are the people who are paying the price for all the imposition of all of these reckless sanctions. Why? Biden and his cabinet, uh, what do they stand to lose? It is the people of the United States of America who are paying for high gasoline prices. It is the people of the United Kingdom who may not be able to heat their homes when gas stops flowing from, 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 from Russia and so on. The empty shops in the Western capitals, you know, the collapse of, of, of the transport system and so on. Those who are really going to bear the brunt are the working people of these countries and not the elites of these countries, not the oligarchs that you find in Washington and London and so on. You understand? Now, it is clear also that, that the intention is, is to harm Russia and is to harm Russia and to send a signal to the people of Russia and elsewhere that the NATO countries are not ready to allow independent thinking in international relations. But all of this has failed. It has clearly failed, you know, because Russia appears to be standing on its feet. It appears to be demanding, making the demands that it has been making for eight years, which were ignored. Look, even, even Emmanuel Macron of France admits that the Russians have legitimate security concerns. What are these legitimate security concerns? It is the eastward expansion of NATO. I mean, to the extent that before the war began, the center of Moscow could actually be hit within five minutes from Ukrainian territory. Which country is going to allow that? No country is going to allow that. Now we also have the issue of, of, of the production of biological and, and, and chemical weapons in laboratories in Ukraine. Who is going to allow that? Who is going to allow that? I am sick, really sick, of the hypocrisy of the so-called West. I am really sick of this level of hypocrisy. Is this a uh, sentiment you're expressing? Is it common across Ghana, would you say? And also, you know, when you look across the African continent, Africa has not joined the US and EU in sanctions against Russia. Can you explain from your point of view why that is? Well, some African countries have actually joined NATO. And, and the U.S. I mean, in Ghana, the government has act, actually voted with the U.S. In the, in the Security Council. You understand? But these are puppet regimes. These are new colonial regimes. These are regimes that are not interested in breaking out of the, of the yoke of exploitation. You understand? Look, let's, let's go back into history. The Russians did not capture our forefathers as beasts of burden. They did not participate in the transatlantic slave trade. They were not involved in the classical colonial exploitation of our people, the seizure of our lands and resources. They did not. In fact, today, they are not involved in the new colonial scramble for our resources. If anything, it is the Russians and others 
mainly from the socialist countries and so on, who rallied to the support of the national liberation movement across Africa and the world, who helped us to struggle to regain our independence and to begin to take the tentative steps towards the control of our own resources and to exploit these resources for the benefit of our people. The Russians are not our enemies. They've never been our enemies. And there's no reason why we should stand against the Russians. And if you look even at the Western media, if you look at Al Jazeera, if you look at uh, the Voice of America, if you listen to the British Broadcasting Corporation, there are harrowing stories of racism, even in this war period. African stories are telling stories of them being prevented from joining buses and trains to safety. In one instance, a Nigerian student told the story of how she had to work for 12 hours because of the color of her skin. She would not be allowed to join a train to go to Poland for safety. And that's as if the bombs discriminate against people on the basis of the color of their skin. I'm an African. And I'm never going to accept, I'm never going to accept any suggestion that on the basis of the color of my skin, I'm inferior to any other person anywhere in the world. I would never accept that Africans or any other people are inferior just because the color of their skin is different. And this should inform our thinking on the continent. This should inform our thinking everywhere. We are not inferior. Ukrainians may be hankering for democracy, they may be hankering for human rights and so on. It doesn't give them the right to discriminate against us. And if they discriminate against us on the basis of our color, we cannot be showing solidarity to racist oppressors, people who have no respect for the African people. I mean, I think that point is is very well taken, and I, I appreciate the point that you were raising there about Russia's role in Africa, because that's become a big talking point. People saying in Mali and Central African Republic, uh, Russia is acting imperialistically. Uh, how do you feel about that charge? Well, I don't know how they come to the conclusion that Russia is acting imperialistically. Today, I want anybody to give me one good reason why NATO should continue to exist. We were told when we were growing up that NATO existed hmm, as, 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 a, as a structure huh, to fight against communism. <laughs> Today, as we speak, is Russia a communist state? Russia is certainly not a communist state. As we speak, Putin is pursuing a nationalist agenda. You understand? Putin is pursuing a nationalist agenda. With the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, and with the dismantling of the Warsaw Pact Treaty nations and so on, what is the justification for the continued existence of NATO today in the world? Absolutely no justification whatsoever. Now, I'm deeply worried about the future of, 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 of the universe. We have been told that the nuclear arsenals we have in the world today, if we were to slip into a thermonuclear war, uh, we have developed the capacity to, de to destroy the world 10 times over. One distraction is sufficient. Just one distraction is sufficient. Isn't it madness to destroy 10 times over one one destruction is sufficient? So we should be thinking, where, where is all this leading us? Are we ready for a thermonuclear war? What will be the consequence of a thermonuclear war for everybody? I may not exist anymore. You understand? My children will not exist. My grandchildren will not have the chance of manifesting in this world. Everything is going to get destroyed. To what end? For what purpose? I think it's time for the peace movement to speak out loud and clear that we are fed up with war, we don't want war, and we want to remove all the conditions which promote war. And the number one condition which promotes war 
is inequality. The number one condition which promotes war is exploitation. The number one condition which promotes war is the imperialist, imperialist bullying attitude. They will have everything for themselves. They will decide for everybody. I mean, what business has the United States of America got deciding whether or not the Nord Stream 2 project succeeds or it doesn't succeed? What is their business? What business has the United States got who buys oil from Russia and who doesn't buy oil from Russia? Is that the business of the United States of America? Certainly not. Let's do the things that promote equity. Let's do the things that promote equality. Let's do the things that banish exploitation in all its forms so that we can have a peaceful, united world of working people working to promote their own interests, working in order to uplift their living and working standards. That should be our goal. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Kwesi Pratt Jr., General Secretary of the Socialist Movement of Ghana, really appreciate you giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.